Um, hello, friends. My name is uh, Ranjit Tanipu. I'm a co-founder of Be Waste Wise, and uh, welcome um, to our panel on sustainable food chains. Um, we have uh, many other panels coming up, so please uh, make sure to check our uh, website for upcoming events and register. Um, uh, we've started a new system of, of, for um, organizing our webinars. We're using Zoom these days. Therefore, there are only 100 um, slots for registration. So uh, make sure you, know, uh, you get uh, to register and attend all these events live. Um, so uh, with that, um, you know, I'll, I'll hand over to um, Heiss and um, he'll take over, he'll be moderating the um, panel today. Um, Heiss? Yes, thanks Ranjit. Uh, let me first shortly introduce myself. I'm Heiss, Heiss Langeveld from the Netherlands and I work as a principal consultant at, uh, at my company, Project Heiss. And I set up initiatives that solve co complex problems in the areas of circular economy and waste management both in the Netherlands and internationally. So this is the second in a series of webinars we organize about food waste. Uh, we organize this together with uh, Be Waste Wise. And the first one was held about three months ago and it was about legislation. Uh, if you haven't seen it, check it out. It's a, it was a very interesting uh, chat on the, uh, well, you uh, the partic particular focus of today's webinar is about sustainable food change. Uh, I'm really excited to host this one, and today we have uh, Chris and Tuan on the line, uh, who I will be introducing more formally in a few moments from now. So, uh, if you're watching this live, uh, you can use the live chat feed. Uh, just ask your question or mark your comment during the presentations, and uh, we'll get back to them. So, please use that uh, function. It's Zoom, so uh, it's a webinar, and if you're live, you have the privilege to ask the questions. So uh, today, uh, the, the, the main challenge that we're focusing on is how are we going to feed uh, the whole, the growing population of the world and reduce our climate impact at both. Uh, reducing uh, food loss and waste is a substantial part of the answer. In 2015, uh, nations of the world adopted the sustainable development goals, including a call for halving the rate of food loss and waste by 2030. So halving the rate of food loss and waste by 2030. So having that question in mind or that goal, um, one, of, one of the projects I'm managing is about how to collect food waste in cities with highly dense areas. So doing our initial research, we found out that there are so many initiatives out there which address food waste. And I got the question, how are we going to do this? Should we focus or, uh, on uh, our efforts on specific initiatives or aim wide? And that's today's subject. Which initiatives are the ones that we actually create impact? So the first speaker I would like to introduce to you is Chris Cochran. Chris is uh, executive director of WeFed, and WeFed is a non-profit organization who uh, and commits, uh, is committed to reduce US food waste. They have identified 27 of the best opportunities. So uh, previously, Chris was the senior manager of sustainability at Walmart, where he developed a first uh, of its kind a food waste analysis for Walmart US that resulted in food waste reduction and donation opportunities. So Chris, um, looking to you, could you please shortly introduce yourself and your background uh, and, and your relation to food waste? Thank you, Heisen, and thank you to the BU Waste uh, webinar series for hosting us. My background is first starting my career with smallholder farmers in Central America and Honduras, and there fell in love with food and agriculture, both because it is a system on which we're mortally dependent and uses the majority of the world's resources, but also because food is so personal and cultural, um, so just a, an area of personal and professional lifelong passion. I then moved to the private sector to try to set up better markets for, for food and worked with Walmart for six years on their corporate sustainability team supporting the food business. Worked on a variety of initiatives there and one of the ones with the highest financial uh, return and also highest potential environmental and social return was food waste reduction. 
I firmly believe that this is a solvable problem with and a tremendous opportunity for value creation, not only a strong business case, but also a key lever to combat the, the climate crisis, to feed an ever-growing uh, hunger, hungry population, and also to improve public health. Uh, Hippocrates said, food is medicine and medicine is food. And I think we're coming back to that realization. So I really take a broad lens of food waste reduction is only a strategy for accomplishing all these other great things in society um, that we probably all find in common on this call. I came to Refed two years ago and was really excited about the position of the organization as a wholly dedicated think and do tank for food waste reduction, primarily in the United States. REFED is actually an acronym. It stands for Rethink Food Waste Through Economics and Data. And we really do believe that data and knowledge can play key roles in directing us to the right solutions. Heidt, as you mentioned, where do we focus our effort? And we believe that economics should lead the way on uh, highlighting areas of focus. So REFED is now the leading source of data, insights, and guidance on food waste reduction in the United States. And we also advise a number of investors, both philanthropic and private, on investing in food waste reduction opportunities. Um, I am at UN Climate Week this week, and so one of the lenses that I'm most immediately bringing is that of the climate crisis. And as we think about the decade that we have to avoid the worst catastrophes of climate change, uh, food waste reduction is a key opportunity that hasn't yet fully been explored. I think historically, the climate community is focused on the energy sector, but there, in the narrative this week, there's a growing realization of the importance of the food sector for climate among food security and other issues we care about. I'd love to share just a few observations about um, the state of the problem some of the solutions and a few key trends. And then I'm looking forward to discussion both with uh, Hayes and Tuan, but also hoping that we get really robust questions uh, through the, the chat function of this webinar. So I've talked about ReFed. I will say in addition to this think tank function of our, our data, we also have a multi-stakeholder network uh, across the public, private, and nonprofit sectors and actually next month has a food waste summit that brings all of those sectors together with the belief that the food system today is, I'm an economist by, by training, so my belief is that the food system today is precisely designed to deliver the results it's delivering. And so if globally a third of food is wasted, and in the United States 40% of food is wasted, that is by design. So we believe that a systems approach to change the incentives um, is the, the only systemic approach to solving the root causes. In the United States, just as this case study, I know we have some participants from the U.S. and some participants who will be looking at the U.S. as a, a benchmark or case study, but we waste 40% of food. This happens throughout the supply chain, and I'm sure some of the, the earlier webinar covered a bit of the differences in developing and developed economies where in the United States, the developed economy, more of the food waste happens further downstream. However, you know, one way to look at this is that over 80% of food waste happens either with consumers in their homes or in consumer-facing businesses. So you might say, well, consumer change is the right answer. I would flip that and say, actually, almost 60% of food waste happens upstream, and the food industry is a major determinant of the food waste in people's homes, depending on how they're serving their consumer. And so we really believe in a business-to-business -business theory of change, not to discount consumer education, but do think that in the scheme of everything on consumers' minds today, that a business-to-business -business approach um, influencing thought leaders from the public, nonprofit, and private sectors is one theory of change that we are really pursuing. Economically, this is 1.3% of GDP in the US. In Mexico, I know it's 2.5% of GDP, so substantial in terms of economic terms. Um, this is a cost to American businesses, and it's going straight out of the bottom line, so investors and shareholders should care about this issue. And then any politician in their home community should care about how much this is costing their consumers. 
this is uh, not food. Food waste is accounting for 20% of our natural resource use, as well as 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions and largest material type in landfill. And then this is all happening with this great paradox of abundance and waste, and at the same time, food insecurity, not only Americans not having enough money to purchase a healthy, uh, uh, purchase sufficient food, but also increasingly not having sufficient dollars to purchase a healthy diet. And so as we see a rise in chronic disease, actually the lens of public health is a, an emerging lens to look at food waste through because food waste is actually primarily fresh foods, those foods that we would like for people to be consuming more of. But the bright spot and, and where ReFed really is, is focused is on the solutions to food waste. And so we came out with a landmark report called the Roadmap to Reduce U.S. Food Waste by 20% back in 2016. And currently we are developing what we're calling the ReFed Insights Engine, which is a, uh, a leading data set of over 50 different sources of public and proprietary data sets that are then analyzed to produce uh, guidance on solutions to food waste. Um, our original analysis showed that an $18 billion investment would yield $100 billion in societal economic value, including impact on all of those areas that we talked about before, business profits, jobs, public health, food insecurity, um, as well as environment. So I mentioned the Insights Engine. Here's just a brief kind of conceptual snapshot of where we get public data sets, proprietary data sets, and draw from our multi-stakeholder network over 100 different experts to then produce what is the problem that we're trying to solve and root causes, what are the solutions, and then actually tracking progress, which is a new feature that we're developing and is critical. If we're going to work five years and almost five years into a goal, that we still can't measure progress against. And that's true across the majority of global governments as well as, um, as, well as the private sector. Here's just a, a sampling of some of the partners we work with just to illustrate how we think of a multi-stakeholder approach from food businesses and investors to policymakers and tech companies to environmental nonprofits and universities. We are hosting a summit coming up next month in San Francisco that is beyond the U.S. in geographic scope. Um, it includes, uh, and we're welcome to an international audience. Uh, we do have an amazing lineup of speakers from across those different stakeholder groups, and we'll be really talking about this theme of shifting from the first four years of the Sustainable Development Goal 12.3 where, where we've accomplished awareness and action. There is recognition that food waste is a problem. Uh, awareness and education, but we are three months from the year 2020, and I think across the SDGs, we're going to be thinking more and more about how are we achieving widespread action, not just awareness, to achieve and be on track for, for achievement of these goals. One of the other things we're doing is accelerating nonprofits in the food recovery sector and focusing on transformational change across use of technology, using Uber for food recovery, use of earned revenue, so having a share in the tax benefits that our donors earn on donating their food, and also focusing on end recipients. And this is just one of the three major solutions areas of prevention, recovery, and recycling, where we felt like there was a gap in innovation that we could accelerate. And that's it. Look forward to, to questions and, and discussion among the group. So thank you, Heise. So uh, thank you very much for explaining uh, uh, your approach and, what, um, and where you're heading at. Uh, uh, at the beginning, we said, well, we, you identified 27 of those uh, important actions. Uh, one of the things is that you're tracking progress now on these solutions. Do you have already data available on on uh, which of these solutions seem to be uh, seem to be the most successful, or, or how far are you in, in measuring your your activities? Great. So we think of the we think of solutions in a couple of different ways. One is how cost effective those solutions are, and the other is how scalable those solutions are. And so as we look across the food recovery hierarchy that has been adopted in the United States, 
it really covers prevention first, you know, eliminating food waste at the source. Second, re recovery. So that food which is unsold actually being donated for human consumption. And then third, recycling and looking at uh, ways that when it can't go to human consumption, it's actually turned back into valuable products in, in agriculture industry. And so as we look at those solution sets, in general, we find that prevention solutions um, have the highest return on investment, it, particularly for the private sector. And I would actually point to a couple of different types of innovation and prevention um, as the most cost effective. The first is digital technologies, including uh, for example, an application of IBM's blockchain is food waste reduction. I was watching the U.S. Open tennis tournament two weeks ago, and IBM chose to focus on how blockchain is helping reduce food waste. And I think that's a great illustration of how many different emerging technologies, including blockchain, including machine learning and predictive analytics, are being applied across the food industry to do better ordering and forecasting, essentially. Second, I think, are physical technologies and hardware technologies. I look at a whole host of innovators. We track over 500 different startups in an innovator database. And there's a whole cohort focused on shelf life extension technologies. Uh, one example is Appeal Sciences. It is based out of the University of California, Santa Barbara, and then was part of a research project with a group of PhD students, and then received a grant from the Gates Foundation it's now raised $125 million in venture capital and just this week rolled out a national program for avocados with Kroger doubling the shelf life of those avocados with a bio-based coating. So I think that's an example of the type of physical technologies or hardware technologies that we're also seeing. Recovery is a tougher economic situation, which is why we think philanthropic funding and nonprofits are appropriate uh, actors for food recovery. And then in recycling in the U.S., uh, due to the regulatory environment and also cheap landfill tip fees, um, the economics are still emerging, but they are, they are changing to be net positive, and the organics recycling uh, sector is primed for scaling in the next few years, especially given changing regulatory environment, including uh, the sixth state organic landfill ban passing to require food businesses to send food waste somewhere other than landfill, and also the, uh, the just maturity of different contracting and structures and business models. Last year, Generate Capital became the, very, the, the largest owner-operator of anaerobic digestion facilities in the U.S., some of which are located in states with policy uh, and others which are located in states without policy. I was on the phone with Jigger Shaw, the co-founder there, and he sees the same opportunity that he saw in renewable energy 15 years ago, now in food waste to value. Okay, great. Um, uh, I, I just got to hear one question from, uh, from uh, Ilse Murphy, and she asked, what is your experience of the introduction of nudge theory to reduce food waste in schools? That's a very specific one. Do you have already experience with that, uh, Chris, or uh, should we discuss that later? Um, I would just briefly say there are a lot of different efforts to be made in schools to shape consumer mindsets. Um, I know of a program here in New York City that has state curriculum for uh, including a on sustainability, including a composting module. Um, there are a lot of experimental efforts given the nature of the education system in the U.S. Um, they often are local efforts. I think there's a real opportunity there. Again, we're not focused on consumer education, but there are a number of groups doing really great work and would be happy to um, highlight those separate offline. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, for now. Uh, we'll pick up the discussion with you uh, uh, a couple of minutes later. I would like to move now to the next speaker. Uh, I would like to introduce you to uh, Tuan Timmermans. And Tuan is a program manager of Circular Economy in Food at the Wageningen University in Research. And he is also coordinator of EU, EU projects uh, Fusions and Refresh. A central ambition of the Refresh project is to develop and implement national framework for action models, uh, which have been implemented in several countries. For the specific country of the Netherlands, Tuan is since 2019 the Managing Director of the Foundation United Against Food Waste. So Tuan, briefly, briefly uh, introduce yourself, your background and your experience in uh, food waste, please. 
Yes, guys, thank you for the introduction. And, and it's a pleasure that I, I can and join us, share shortly some of my experience. Um, to understand, I was trained as an engineer here at Wageningen University 30 years ago, it's a long time ago. I did, did my master's in artificial intelligence, so data and technology is my background. But I've learned that solving these complex issue has to do with technology as an enabling factor, but it's all behavioral related issues. It's all not only getting the hardware right, but also the software and the orgware. The topic of food waste came on my, my radar 20 years ago. So I have 20 years experience working with businesses, with governments, with all types of different organizations, starting in the Netherlands, but expanding that work basically all over the world to look how, how can we get things on the agenda, create coalitions and work on the thousands of solutions that we need in a systemic way, not only to fight food waste, but to build a better food system. Because I think that's the main driver to get sufficient use of all the resources that we have in, and, and make sure that we use them as nutrition, nutritious and valuable food. Okay, that's great. Um, so um, uh, I, I understand, well, I, I already see a picture on, on your background. Recently, the World Resource Institute has published a report about uh, reducing food loss and food waste. You contributed uh, to that one. Could you uh, uh, um, explain some of the main findings of the report and, 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 and what, what are, what are the, uh, the, the results meaning for, for this, uh, for, 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 uh, for all the participants which are listening in there? Yes, I'm happy, happy to do so. So this, this new re report that was launched in Copenhagen about, about a month ago called, called Reducing Food Loss and Waste, Setting a Global Action Agenda, brings together the expertise of, of I think, uh, almost 100 people contributed to that, that work. And it is a next step in collating all the things. What do we know about the topic? What is happening worldwide? And what are the learned lessons to build coalitions that follow that mantra of targeting, measuring, and acting to create impact? What it brings also together is that more countries and more businesses have set targets following the SDT 12.3 targets, are working on creating coalitions and do measurements and be transparent about it. But if you look though, who is really already committed and working consistently, systemically on reducing food waste and contributing to a better food system, then the, the global map is more or less empty. There's only very few countries that are in the stage like we have the coalitions that are targeted with all the front runner businesses, governments and other organizations on board to really and are on track on halving food loss and waste within 2030. So this, all, this report also gives insights So why do we do it? As already mentioned by Chris, uh, there's a strong and we, we see climate change is getting stronger on the agenda, six to eight percent of greenhouse gas emissions is related to the food that has been produced and not eaten. So, and it's, I think the single easiest thing we can really change if we all want to, but there's also the economic aspect and the nutritious aspect to it. Because we know if you look at the fact at the moment in the world, enough food is produced to feed 12 billion people. So we also need to work on the new narrative, making sure that we use your resources best and not only invest in what we call the old system, producing more with less, but see also how we can we use better what we already have and, easy, and, and also distribute it in the right way. Based on that, there's 10 interventions being, being uh, collated, like these are the 10 best things that should happen in all different parts of the world to, uh, to, to, to really make sure that we are on track on meeting sustainable development goal 12.3. Uh, 12 I think it's too long list to go to all these 10 of them. So my suggestion is to go and read it, but it is all about partnerships. It's about Western countries creating the positive social norm. So like it's normal to use everything uh, because consumers and the, the, yeah, the organizations that are selling to consumers, to business to consumers, 70% of the waste is there and the impact is relatively even, even higher. Uh, but it is also working on financing, uh, working on getting better data because we still lack good data across the world. There's no country that has perfect data yet. There are some that have relatively good data and working on it. So there's a lot of things we, we, we should do and can do if we all want to. Great. 
Great. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I, I did read the report before this meeting, and uh, there's so much information there. It's so condensed that uh, you actually, uh, well, I, I, I can uh, recommend it to any reader here to or listening in uh, to to read it. Um, and maybe it may be good to add because this is a starting point. On uh, November 12, the the second version of the report will be published, uh, and that's. At that, so it will go more specifically on the 10 intervention and what's the state of the art in that type of interventions and what's happening in the world on partnerships, uh, for example, on linking and modeling uh, greenhouse gas emissions related to food loss and waste and how to identify hotspots and specific actions. So uh, uh, I've, I've seen it and I think it's quite amazing what's, what's in there as, as additional information. So this is just the first appetizer. Okay, okay. Well, I'm getting ready for dinner then, uh, <laughs> to talk in food terms. Um, uh, could you maybe also surely introduce the, the programs that you're running, uh, Fusions, Refresh, and the United Against uh, Food Waste uh, Initiative in the Netherlands? So, uh, what are the involved uh, stakeholders and how do you support initiatives and, and, and how do you focus on or, or which uh, initiatives you should support in, in some sense? Yeah, so I, can, I, I shall start in chronological order with Fusions and Refresh. Both project is finished. So both were the, the, the first uh, leading pan-European programs to understand better the drivers, to get good data, and that was in Fusion. So that we found on first, on a harmonized way, relevant data on how much food to waste do we have in Europe, uh, what's the value of it, et cetera, and the impacts. That has also led in setting a global uh, food loss and waste uh, accounting and reporting standard as a methodology that should and can be used by all actors all over the world to get harmonized data. So now we know since 2014 that in Europe we have about 88 million tons of food waste uh, valuing about 140 uh, billion, billion euros. So it's quite significant, including 6% of greenhouse gas emissions. As a follow-up project, Fusions, uh, after Fusions Refresh was started, uh, a project with 26 partners, and of course, looking at what's the evidence, what's the tools that can be used uh, to do decent uh, life cycle assessment and life cycle cost, cost uh, assessment innovations. But I think the key things that made the difference in Refresh is finally understand what are drivers for consumers to create this positive social norm, and what are like the, the type of interventions that can actually be successful in reducing food waste at consumer level. And the second thing is, how can we help countries or regions to set up public-private or private-public partnerships that really tackle together uh, the fight against food waste? And we tested that model and we developed the blueprint with all of the partners, uh, tested that model in five countries, the Netherlands, Germany, Hungary, Spain, and China, with the target of, because they, at the starting point, they were in a different stage of maturity and different culture of working together to advance those, to progress those. And I'm quite happy to, to see that after four years that in almost all of these countries, there's really now a strong consortium and a coalition at national level that definitely will bring this further. The leading one in this, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's the Netherlands and I was directly involved in that. And I thought like, this is not finished yet, so I ne need to take this further. Uh, so this has been set up as a, as a coalition now, as an independent foundation with founding fathers, with a stakeholder and a governance model, focusing on how can the Netherlands be one of the first countries in the world to meet SDG 12.3 target. Meaning that we have to find 1 million tons of food waste that currently occurs annually and keep it in the supply chain in a systemic way. So we have the best plan and we are now working on it with our stakeholders, with our front runners, support from the government. We have some of the fundings in place. We have the team in place. So we are very hard working now on focusing on impact, accelerate and connect everything what was already happening to, uh, to show that, yeah, that really we can do this. I was just wondering, because I think it's an interesting approach you take here. Uh, Chris, uh, if I ask to you, to, to what extent is the approach similar or different from the ones that, that you take? There are probably some similarities in the multi-stakeholder nature of the approach. I think one of the cautions I have is we have 10 years to complete the goal 
And I think there's a balance between the collaborative aspect and make, continuing to make sure that that's action oriented. And then also knowing that we need to continue to lead, lean into the business case for individual action as well. Um, there's a strong, this is one of the issues that has a strong financial case for food businesses. So continuing to put that front and center, I think is a critical enabler of the private sector's action in addition to what's needed in collective action and with a multi-stakeholder network. Okay, yeah. Uh, so um, uh, I think in, in both cases uh, you, you say, well, we should uh, actually work with all stakeholders involved and because and, and, uh, that's probably the only way to get to change the system, as you, as you say. Um, very interesting, uh, uh, Tuan and Chris, uh, uh, for sharing your stories. Um, I would like to, uh, to, to uh, open the floor now for questions from the audience. Um, let me see what I've got already on the on the on the chat. Uh, I've got a couple of questions where we can download this report. One, uh, um, uh, that's a very practical question. Uh, but where can people find the, your report? If if you go on Google or any search engine, look at World Resources Institute reducing food loss and waste, setting a global action agenda. Uh, then you can easily find it on the on the on the web. Uh, okay. And there's a lot of more information information there. And it's also it also has a summary to it, so with ten pages, if you want to go to do the quick quick reading. Okay, so could you so recycling food loss and waste is the title, right? Reducing food loss. Oh, and waste. reducing. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so if you Google on the specific title, you will probably find it. Uh, the second one is, I think, a very interesting one. Uh, is uh, is uh, both Elaine and Gweppi from Cameroon. Uh, well, both sure we're talking about Europe and the United States. And uh, well, the question is, I would like to know what strategies are in place against food waste in developing countries, and if there are any organisations here working on them. Um, so, so obviously, uh, it's, uh, right now, it's it's uh, we invited two Western uh, uh, people from Western countries. But do you have uh, any experience or or recommendations to for developing countries? Yes, I I, I have some. I, I, as you already explained, yes, we are working in Western countries, Europe, but we also have a focus on on developing countries. I was in Ethiopia last week. And there we had the launch of the Global Consortium for Innovation in Post-Harvest Loss and Food Waste Reduction. So we are expanding this, this model of collaborative action to a global stage. So this is a consortium. It starts, we start with universities and knowledge institutions. It's led by Iowa State in the US and it's supported by Rockefeller Foundation and FR. But we have a network as a starting point of universities in, uh, in Brazil, in Honduras, in South Africa, Stellenbosch, University of Nairobi, in Ghana, Israel, and, and Wageningen as a starting point to build this network of universities globally to also look specifically at what can be done in reducing and preventing food losses uh, at the, in, in emerging countries. And what I think is exciting to see that if you look at the solutions, uh, we can definitely leapfrog some of these technological areas and, and, and build on the latest innovation in these areas because we don't have the lock-ins and we don't have the issues that are facing the modern Western uh, society. So we really can build on a next generation of solutions, looking also at lots of opportunities where uh, that, that are much easier and more impactful than some of the others. But of course, we have the typical structures there with mostly small the farmers getting access to, uh, to, to market. Uh, financing is always a difficult issue. And getting the attention of the governments. Because we see that if you want to have a really systemic approach, you also need governments and, and regulators on board to create a long-term perspective. And that's challenging in some more uh, developing developing areas. Okay, thanks, Juan. Uh, how, how about you, Chris? Uh, do you have any recommendations for developing countries or how they should proceed? Well, I would look uh, to a couple of programs just as resources. I think in addition to the World Resources Institute, which has a global remit, I would also look to uh, the World Bank, which recently, just yesterday, shared that they've actually given a billion dollars in sustainable development bonds for food loss and waste. Um, I would also look to the rice industry. 
Um, the sustainable rice platform just uh, this week committed to sustainable development goal 12.3, recognizing that with a 34% current waste rate, cutting that in half um, would increase the supply by 17% on existing, on existing land. And that would partially meet a 25% increase in rice demand over the next decade. So I think there are a number of both general resources and also industry-specific resources available. I would say across the globe, I feel like uh, any organization focused on food and agriculture is likely to have a food loss and waste resource appropriate to that country or commodity or area of focus. Correct. Um, okay, and I see we have um, uh, nine minutes left for this session. So um, uh, I, I just uh, I, I, we got some more questions. Uh, I will just uh, pick one which I think is uh, quite interesting. It's uh, uh, there's a lot of questions about uh, specific programs in developing countries, but um, I think that's a little bit beyond the, the session. Uh, but one specific question is about the scope of carbon off offsets projects in reducing food waste. Uh, do you, do you, do you, uh, um, what is the role of these carbon offsets in, in your, uh, well, in the programs that you're running or in your company? How do you deal with that? So I'm familiar with uh, some of the carbon offset programs in my current state of California, for example. And in particular, that can be a, a difference maker in the economics being uh, positive ROI or not for some of the organics recycling projects like anaerobic digestion. Um, one of the challenges is that those carbon offsets in California, at least, are only qualified when it's avoiding landfill. And so if there's something that's not going to landfill, let's say it's going to composting today, but it could go to a higher value use. Um, one of the challenges with how the carbon offset programs work today is that it doesn't give credit uh, for an improvement in value unless that baseline is currently going to landfill. Um, so I think that has made, especially on farm projects and anaerobic digestion challenging since most of food loss on farms is actually currently composted, not the additional step of paying for transportation to landfill. So just one case example, um, where I think the policy can be an enabler, but also is imperfect in dealing with food, which is complex, and the, the solution set to food waste is uh, multi-layered, not just binary. Yes, there's, there's a lot to be said about it. And, and uh, Christian mentioned a few times uh, anaerobic digestion, and I have a particular opinion on that, and that's backed by legislation also in, in, in Europe. Uh, understanding that uh, if you work on food loss and waste, prevention comes first, then make, try to get it to people by processing or redistributing, using it for animal feed, and by definition, all other things is waste management. So it has no net value unless you subsidize it. That's the current system approach in, in Europe. So, of course, we have to take in a circular economy, take care of, the, of, of good soil, but getting energy out of food is always and has always has negative impact because there has been so much more energy being put in it, and we all know that the agriculture sector is addicted to fossil fuels at the moment. So it, this never will be a positive contribution. Of course, it has a challenge to how do you do the right calculations on on carbon uh, uh, offsets? Uh, has to do with price calculation, true pricing, carbon prices in the future. Uh, but we believe that if you focus on the highest ladders of the food use pyramid uh, and not go in the area of waste managers unless unavoidable then you you might be on the good side of this in europe in most in many countries it's it, it's no it's illegal to to landfill uh, but our lock-in in the netherlands for example is incineration so we have overcapacity in incinerators we basically have to import the waste from the uk and italy to keep them up and running so that's our lock-in here so we have to Instead of investing in more AD, we have to make sure that we use all the resources and at, at best or yeah, prevent it and otherwise try to keep them in the food supply chain as animal feed. One of the things we are focusing on in our approach is can we look at uh, blocking legislation? 
for example, uh, that's, that's one of the critical things. We also worked on in Refresh, 40 million tons of food in, the Euro in Europe is wasted because it's needed to be done by law because it's, there's a potential risk that uh, there could be animal diseases related to it. At the time the legislation was introduced, this made a lot of sense. It doesn't make sense anymore because the solution is, is there to do it safely for animal health and for human health. But we have to reintroduce and to look, can, can we change this legislation based on practices what we know now? So it's not only that we look at consumer changing habit and behavior, but also looking at the very impactful complex issues and build coalitions to at the end in Europe, quite, quite difficult to change legislation, legislation that 27 countries do agree upon. So these are the long-term issues we're also working on. Yes, um, I, I just want to try to uh, pick one or two more questions from the audience. Uh, I've got a very interesting one, uh, uh, which is uh, actually for, for an a exporting country like the Netherlands, uh, quite relevant. How crazy would be the idea to, to that hope for one day that every country can produce its own food and manage its own waste? Would that be part of your solution or do you think uh, uh, the competitive advantage of nations might be uh, uh, also uh, suitable for food, for food production? How do, how do you view that one? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Being from the Netherlands, that's something we cannot think about because we, we are the second largest exporter of food, food and agri-food products in the world. So we have trade in our DNA and we know that supply chains are globally so interlinked that's difficult. But of course, we will see a very interesting experiment happening if the Brexit will pass in the UK because there's really concern there if, if trade uh, relations are different, then that we might end up in a situation that import and exports will be uh, reduced. So what will happen to the situation in the UK? So that's an interesting field lab that we will expose to. But personally, I don't, I, don't, I don't believe in this. We need to relook at where can we produce in the most sustainable way, knowing that uh, also from a sustainability point of view, if you use the right logistics system, it is not that high a footprint on the logistics as people might, uh, tend to think. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with that and just mention one other trend that I think is highly relevant is that of indoor or protected agriculture. And knowing the, knowing the current uh, leadership of the Netherlands in that as well, but seeing greenhouses and vertical farming, uh, especially around urban centers or distribution centers, um, being a, a key change that's happening in production systems, which will enable more local production as certain types of high value specialty crops that could be grown in protected agriculture. So just mention that I do think over the next decade will be a key trend to watch in certain categories, particularly produce. Okay, great. Uh, well, we're getting to the end of the session. Um, uh, there are some questions which we, uh, which I sadly we don't have any time for anymore. Uh, I think if I need to wrap up your story, then uh, uh, food waste is an important, uh, or, or food is something we should have a look to, and, and also the nature might change uh, regarding if we are going to have a healthier diet, which is. Uh, Chris, then also we, we're going to consume actually more food and fresh food. So also there, there is a challenge. We should uh, define our activities based on, uh, on research and uh, track the progress of each activity uh, and build partnerships to, uh, to, uh, towards the solutions. Um, my final question to you both would be like, if you have one specific recommendation to increase impact, uh, what would it be uh, uh, to the world? Mine would be to have the mindset of action orientation, realizing that the clock is, you know, our, our year is going to turn 2020 in three months. And we're no longer thinking about 2030 as something in the distant future, but rather a, a need for rapid scaled action. So to ask for an action oriented mindset and a sense of urgency in solving these problems, not a sense of complacency or pontification. Clear. Yeah, I, I can definitely uh, uh, agree with that, that Chris. It's, it's, uh, we, we know the solutions, we know it can be done, but it is how to create the mindset and the sense of urgency. 
um, but also to make sure that that those the fronters that that set targets that are committed that's a starting point start doing your transfer your, your measurements be transparent about it and start with the action so everybody starting actions and we'll find and celebrate success we'll look at the next step and finally you come up to the real complex issue and that has always to do with changing mindset changing behavior norm, norms supply chain collaboration and that's what finally we need to come to systemic solutions but i'm quite hopeful that because yesterday that uh, organized by the champions 12.3 coalition there were about 20 global leaders sitting together on what are the next steps that we need i saw the summary of the outcome and that gives me hope that that also global leaders will will definitely make this relevant important linking to the crucial societal challenge that that we have and that is nutritious food climate change because if you look at sustainable goal 12.3 uh, halving food waste it is relinked to so many other crucial issues that we have to solve and can solve because if we cannot reduce food waste as a, as, a, as a thing that most people would agree like yes that is something that we all uh, favor uh, favor of what else can we do so this is the concretest thing we can do. Everybody can contribute and nobody in principle can be against if, if, if we do the right things. Okay, thanks, Juan. Uh, that was a very long sentence, but I, uh, I totally agree <laughs> with you uh, what you said there. Uh, no worries. Um, just let me close here with this. Uh, I would like to thank you, Chris and Juan, very, very much for your time and sharing your expertise with everybody. Uh, I would like to uh, thank the audience uh, for your attention and your questions. I'm very sorry we couldn't handle all of them, but uh, I tried to do a, a, to, to pick some. Uh, thank you, Be Ways Wise, for hosting this webinar and this series. I understand it will all be online available as a replay in case that you would like to share this with your friends, for example. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I will also share the, some of the key messages via our own website, beyondfoodwaste.com, which is a blog uh, website which I run together with Kat Heinrich from Australia. Uh, where we share best practices about food waste around the world. So um, I would like to encourage you to have a look there as well. Um, so back to you, uh, Ranjit. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is um, Ranjit again. Um, hi, and uh, Kat, thank you so much for covering the theme of food waste on Be Waste Wise. Greatly appreciate your time. And um, um, Chris, I've been a great fan of your work at Refed. Uh, so thanks for you know, joining the Be Waste Wise panel. And uh, Tuan, um, I wasn't aware of all the great work that's happening in Netherlands. So thank you so much for you know introducing all of that to uh, a global audience. And um, I just wanted to mention that uh, you know our mission here at Be Waste Wise is to make high quality expertise easily accessible. Um, you know it's generally only um, accessible in you know lengthy PDF reports or um, international conferences. But through Be Waste Wise, we actually make it accessible to everyone for free. Um, so if you're a large organization um, who would like to use webinars as a medium to uh, share your knowledge with a global audience, please get in touch with us. Uh, we are a nonprofit and we can work together um, uh, some uh, arrangement to make that possible. Um, with that, uh, friends, uh, please uh, visit our website, wastewise.be, to check uh, upcoming webinars um, and also uh, follow us on Facebook and um, all the social media. Uh, all right. Hi, Chris and uh, Tuan. Thank you so much. Um, have a good day. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.